Greetings and welcome to another edition of Access for All. My name is Roberto Mucaro Borrero and I'll be your guest host for today. Um, I'm here in the studio with uh, Tony Castagna. He's an activist all the way from Hawaii who's here in New York City for a little while. He's working on a very interesting subject. Tony, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Roberto. Thanks. Now, um, Tony, you have a very interesting story and I think I'd like to start off with that. Maybe you can tell a little bit about uh, yourself and where you're from and a little bit about your family history so we can start it off. Uh, yes, Roberto. Uh, well, I'm a, a Boricua from Hawaii. Uh, our, our ancestors, our Puerto Rican ancestors, uh, were brought over from the island as uh, sugar plantation laborers uh, about a hundred years ago. Uh, they, uh, after, after the great hurricane uh, San Suriaco of 1899, when the island was devastated, uh, they were recruited by uh, plantation laborers in Hawaii. Um, they were essentially brought over as indentured laborers or uh, slave laborers, in a sense. Uh, um, was this a forced... Uh uh, migration or did they know that they were going to Hawaii? In many cases uh, it was. Uh, some some believe that they were only being taken to the other side of the island of uh, Boring Ken. Um, some were told that Spanish was the spoken language of communication in Hawaii. Others were promised uh, you know that they'd, they'd get rich fast. As it turned out uh, uh, none of this was true. Mm -hmm. It was only to um, you know, enhance the uh, uh, capitalist system that was uh, was happening, going on in Hawaii, to uh, fulfill the uh, 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 mission of the uh, uh, sugar plantation laborers there, who were ex actually ex-missionaries. So this all happened about a hundred years ago. Right. In fact, uh, this year is the centennial of the first body clause to to migrate to Hawaii which occurred in 1900. Uh, just uh, for some of the uh, viewers who might not be familiar with the term Boricua, I'm sure right. there's a lot of people here in New York of course will know what that means but maybe you can um, give some background on what that term means and also Boriken or Borinken as you as you stated. Borinken is the Indian name of the of the island of, of Puerto Rico. It's the name that our ancestors uh, refer to the island as and, and Boricua is derived from from Borican, mm -hmm. and uh, the, these are these are Indian terms. So those who came to Hawaii, they did not initially identify as as Puerto Rican, which is basically a Spanish colonial uh, right. term. They identified as Boricua or or Hibaro because mm -hmm. they were the um, they were the Indian peoples of the mountain region. They were coffee and uh, yucca farmers. Now. This whole idea of um, indigenous peoples or quote-unquote Indians, Indios in Puerto Rico is, is um, a subject that seems to be coming up more and more these days. Uh, recently in the island of what's known today as Puerto Rico, on the island of Boriquen, as we will we'll call it uh, during this show, um, there was just some studies that were done that shows that uh, a large part of the population uh, according to these uh, academics, it was 60% of their subjects tested to have DNA mm -hmm. linked to the indigenous peoples. Right. So the subject is, is an interesting subject. It's coming up, and there's more activism towards that. But I think it's especially pertinent now because we're just coming off what's known as the uh, Columbus Day right. celebrations. Do they have the Columbus Day over there in Hawaii? It's called... Uh, they used to. It used to be called Columbus Day, but it's now called Discoverer's Day. And um, since Columbus didn't make it to Hawaii, uh, it was actually Captain Cook who made it there. Mm -hmm. They decided to change the name to Discoverer's Day in order to uh, actually celebrate both of them. So right. You get the two for one. Amazing. Right. You know, just uh, thinking about Columbus and, um, you know, when we were growing up and went to school, um, and even the way they, they're still promoting it, many people don't know uh, just how immoral, I guess it would be, to promote somebody like Columbus. Uh, for many people that uh, are aware of this issue, they've compared 
uh, Christopher Columbus actually to Adolf Hitler mm -hmm. uh, because of the effects that he had on the indigenous peoples of not only the Caribbean, but the effects all over. Right. Now, you're doing some interesting work um, that has something to do with this issue, but it specifically deals with the role of the Catholic Church involved in the Columbus issue. So I, I want you to uh, elaborate a little bit more about this for the viewers. Uh, yes, this concerns the issue of a certain papal uh, edict or decree which was passed to Columbus by Pope Al Alexander the Sixth. It's it's called the papal bull uh, in intercetera. Um, these papal bulls are, are were thought to be divine, right? Divine right of God passed from God to the Pope down to the crown. And this was the document that Columbus carried with him on his second voyage into the Caribbean in 1493. Um, he basically used it as a justification to enslave uh, the peoples of, of what's known today as Haiti and, and the Dominican Republic. Um, subsequently, as we know, millions uh, uh, perished as, as a result of the um, uh, the Spanish colonial colonial project, and interesting that you bring up Hitler now. When you, I think some people, you know, when you make the comparison, and they're maybe stunned, but because you know, 500 years ago, that's kind of lost in the collective memory. But right. really, what happened in in the Caribbean? It was basically a systematic genocide campaign, where they basically worked our ancestors to death. Um, it's very similar to what happened, uh, you know, in, in Europe. But, but you know, we're talking of tens of millions. Well, not, not only that, I mean, also the, that we have to remember the, actually the diseases, the pathogens that they brought over that the people were not immune to also right. uh, had effects, uh, must have had effects, sure. devastating effects on, on the populace. Right. And um, from what I know, uh, you can probably... Uh, add a little more to this, the resistance itself, you know, from the people, also there was a certain amount of warfare because I'm mm -hmm. sure the people did not just sit there and allow all this to happen to right. them, you know? Right. Now, um, thinking about that, thinking about like a, a papal edict mm -hmm. that actually gave the, the Christians and Columbus the power to, to subjugate this hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, or specifically starting in the Caribbean, how does that affect, uh, let's say, the American Indian populations here in what's known as the United States today? Okay, well, well, let me let me just backtrack for one second sure. yet to say that the ideology of these bulls, right? Mm -hmm. This was mm, this had been going on since the Crusades, right? And these documents they established Christian dominion and subjugation, called for the subjugation of non-Christians. Yeah, so right. if you weren't a Christian. Uh, you know, you were c considered a pagan or heathen and, and, and better off dead. Right. Let me just read uh, here, the 1452 bull, which was the bull that was passed from Pope Nicholas to King Alfonso of Portugal. Yeah, this, this basically sanctioned the, the Portuguese genocide campaign into Africa. It reads, uh, uh, Nicholas directed King Alfonso to, to, quote, capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens pagans and other enemies of Christ to put them into perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. This is a quote from uh, Davenport. Um, so this is, this is a whole body of language that had been developed over centuries. And this document, the 1493 bull, is what uh, was used in the Americas. So this document, that papal bull was actually used, um, I just want to make that clear, for the subjugations of the peoples of Africa. Right. And that gave them the right to go and, quote, unquote, enslave those peoples. Right, right. So, right. and this is also uh, something that we need to think about, I would think, Tony. Uh, when we're talking about Columbus and celebrating Columbus Day, we have to remember his role also as the first transatlantic slave trader in the hemisphere. Sure, I right. mean, he first started out with bringing Tainos back to the Spanish court. Yeah. And then after they established themselves in the, in the Caribbean islands, that's when they started the importation of the... Africans exactly. who were enslaved. Yeah. So now, 
I'd like to bring this um, so that people can also see the correlations. Let's bring it to what's happening here in the United States, what's known as the United States today, yeah. to um, the American Indians here. How does this affect them as well? Right. The, um, there's what's called the Doctrine of Discovery. It's a whole body of language, which is, that was Christian dominion. Uh, the Doctrine of Discovery, interestingly, forms the basis of what's, what, what's known as, or what was known as the Law of Nations. Mm -hmm. And that was basically uh, relationships between European nations in order to, to keep the peace between them. Um, basically, these were Christian, you know, European Christian nations. Right. Um, now, after the United States formed in 1823, Chief Justice John Marshall uh, in order to skate around the separation of church and state built under the U.S. Constitution, he quietly inserted language of dominion into certain Supreme Court decisions. The first uh, uh, large case was, was the Johnson v. McIntosh decision. This was uh, in tune with the increased European uh, uh, peoples coming into the Americas and also um, Europeans coveting Indian lands, the resources. So in order to so-called win the West, yeah, quote unquote, yeah. Or, or I should say this is how the West was won in a sense, um, basically the language of dominion was inserted into federal Indian law, uh, inserted into the Cherokee versus nation, uh, right. Cherokee versus Georgia decision, mm -hmm. and um, you know eventually you know the the Cherokee of Georgia. I mean, how did they end up in Oklahoma? You know, the Trail of Tears. I mean, this is all a part of this body of of language. So that was that law that um, that Supreme Court law actually affected those peoples at that time, but it still affects them today. Sure. Sure, so a lot sure. of the, the reasons why we have um, uh, the reservation systems and also, uh, for example, the Navajo right now in Arizona, they're, they're uh, facing forced relocation sure. once again yeah, from their homeland. That's a good example. And this is okay. after they had already moved them. Right, right. They've been moved several times. It, it's, it's an incredible, incredible story that, um, that you know, it's, it's interesting because this even extended over to places like Australia as well, where they use this doctrine of discovery to take over the Australian Aborigines. Sure. And um, what can be done, Tony, now, um, what's being done in order to address this issue? I know this is something that you've been working on for quite a while, as other people have right. been working on this. Right. But uh, maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing to uh, get people aware, because if this, this is, has this ever been this papal bull that, um, that in essence gave life to this Supreme Court ruling here in the United States, has this ever been revoked or the, is the Catholic Church still following that line? Well, it's more symbolic today in a sense, um, but really uh, it does form the basis of the international system today. Everything, you can trace, trace it down. And I would like to say at this time that Steve Newcomb of the Indigenous Law Institute, um, who actually, uh, the Indigenous Law Institute initially uh, implemented the campaign in 1992 mm -hmm. to call for the revocation of the bull. Steve has done years of research into uh, the ideology of these documents. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to acknowledge him and his work. But really, um, this issue is, is much, much larger than, you know, any one person or group. It goes back again to 500 years because right. it was being opposed back then until uh, basically today. So, you know, from 1992 on, there's been a formal campaign to revoke the bull. In 1997, in Honolulu, we uh, began to do initial uh, uh, papal bulls burning. Uh, what does that mean, papal bulls burning? We were basically protesting discoverers, or Columbus Day in, in Honolulu. Um, what we do is on October 12th, we do a symbolic burn outside of the Catholic diocese of Honolulu. And, uh, you know, it's really a, a, a campaign to educate people and build awareness around this issue. But when you say burning, do you actually burn? Yeah, we actually do a, a burning. Of, so this of is the, like a copy of the document? It's a copy of the document that we, we do a burning. And mm -hmm. um, last year we met with the bishop, actually, of Honolulu. And uh, bef just before we did it, and um, he basically 
uh, you know, he knew what we were doing. He, he kind of uh, supported, you know, our efforts. And uh, we invited him to join us, but uh, he was kind of tied up that afternoon. So uh, right. we let him off the hook. But, um, you know, we've been working with a lot of Catholics. Uh, and uh, we, we put in a formal request uh, a couple months ago for an audience with the Pope. This and, is what I wanted uh, to right. really get to, because now, yeah. um, understanding that you've been taking on this campaign and you're, you're advancing and more and more people are becoming aware of it, right. you've actually just come back right. from Rome right. uh, just, uh, just a few days ago and before your stop here in New York. So why don't you tell us how uh, things went, what are some of the things you did in Rome, and um, how far did you actually get into yeah. the papal echelon? <laughs> Yeah, well, what, well, you know, what we've been doing since 97 is, you know, like I said, to ra raise awareness and, and get the word out. And one thing led to another. And last year, we, we had an appeal to the, to the Vatican uh, to revoke the bull. And this is in conjunction with the, the Jubilee yeah, this year. Um, the Catholic Church is, you know, seeking atonement, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. They say they want to enter the third millennium with a quote-unquote clear conscience so right. we decided that this was a, a good time to move with the issue and uh, we planned it around October 12th so we could be in Rome at that time um, you know around the time of Columbus Day yeah, right. in order to educate and uh, we put in a request like I said a, a couple months ago for an audience and um, we've been in contact probably with with a it's called the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace right. in, in Rome. And I've been, you know, on the phone with them and working with them. And uh, the audience sort of fell through before we left. And we found out that you know, there's so many people that want to want to meet with the Pope. It's almost near, yeah. nearly impossible. But we had set up numerous um, events and uh, activities you know, before leaving, because you know we didn't want to throw all our eggs in one hat. Hat, and uh, you know, basically we presented um, the information on the bulls at several panels in Torino, in Milan. We had uh, several now, press the, conferences. How did the uh, uh, Italian people per se take to, yeah, to this it, whole it, idea of of bringing something like this and and bringing something like this to light yeah. in Italy? Well, people really, you know, this issue is really um, unknown to, to, to most people, I mean, in the United States also, in Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know. In Italy, there, I mean, once we, we raise the issue, the people, I mean, they, they eat it up. I mean, it's like, yeah, okay, we didn't know about this, and they want to know more. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so they were very supportive, and they were, you know, those... We, we spoke to one audience in uh, Milan, over 200 people and uh, they wouldn't leave they kept sitting there and we went off for about three hours and uh, and then we went into Rome and uh, we had uh, we had a press conference which was quite significant and we received quite a bit of press um, we had an article in the Liberazione which is more or less a communist newspaper Right. And then we had a, a piece in the Herald Tribune, the International Herald Tribune, and then uh, also uh, CNN Latin America. They, they so you got a, a, a pretty much an, a good deal of press while you were there. Right. Now, um, in regards to the official audience itself, did it make it to the uh, any official channels in, into the Vatican? Okay, what, um, what occurred was for the first time, uh, we've, we were able to push this issue to, let's say, a higher level, mm -hmm. in that it has been received at the Secretary of State at a certain pontifical, count, uh, pontif pontifical historical commission or uh, committee for historical sciences. It's one of the two. Um, which means that for the first time the Vatican is going to seriously uh, look at and, and consider the issue. Right. Um, so in a sense that that was uh, that was a victory um, for us. Now we were really hoping that they don't end up studying it to death. 
Correct. I mean, if, if it's anything like, you know, Galileo, I mean, we're going to be here, be here for a long time. And, uh, what we what we really need to do, the, it's really kind of a two-tier two movement now. Mm -hmm. You got the in, work in the insides, which Steve Newcomb is doing a lot of work uh, within the Secretariat of State. Right. Right. And then I, I, I and Daniela Minervi, who is the coordinator for Italy, have been doing uh, work with the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace. Right. That's one arena where it's very sensitive to, to, right. to work the channels. Now the other arena of course is educating the people and the public. Right, uh, which is my next very question. Important. Right. Yeah. What can people do uh, once they're hearing about this, and I'm sure this is fascinating to many people who haven't heard about any of this before. Yeah. Uh, people are still thinking Columbus is a, is a great day to, to celebrate until you really start to think about it. So now what can people do, regular people or, or organizations or groups that want to get involved um, maybe on, on some level or various levels? Um, well, we have a website mm -hmm. and I think that will probably... We'll show that at the end of okay. the, the program. We'll give your contact That'll, information right. and, we can see that in, and we'll see that in the credits. Yeah. In the website we have an appeal to the Vatican mm -hmm. to revoke the, revoke the bull and it's been signed. We've, we've received hundreds of signatures on hard copy and also over the internet. People right. could sign that and send it in. We've already delivered uh, hundreds of signatures to, to the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Um, you know, they could contact you or contact me um, at our emails. Now, uh, do you plan to go back again right, to, that, to make the appeal? See, that's the... Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the the delegation itself. There were nine of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of a, we had about 15 to 18 originally scheduled. We were able to get nine of us to go there, and uh, w you know you could just tell from the delegation the energy, the high level of energy among us, and and. Uh, you know the reason that the reason that we were there. I mean, yeah. it was like we were being moved by, you know, this 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 force that was beyond us. You know, right. it's kind of like, you know, we were really being moved by the the spirit. Yeah, in a sense, it was really at this metaphysical uh, level, and uh, so we were able to, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, People agreed on the fact that it needs to happen We had again. consensus among most of us on most of the issues. Now, uh, what came out of it was that uh, we are planning to return again next year mm -hmm. with more people right. and uh, more delegates and, and getting the word out. So, you know, if there are groups that are interested, um, they could email me um, and we, you know, we could coordinate. Right. Um, there are a few groups who are you know, in the middle of it, like the Indigenous Law Institute, um, the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, which is my, my group, and the Hawaii Ecumenical Coalition. Um, about half of that, half the delegation was from Hawaii, mm -hmm. and we've been working very closely uh, around the issue. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this, and also we can keep our viewers updated with what's happening on the issue, and. Um, before we only have a few minutes left mm -hmm. so is there anything you'd like to say before we close out well there is something that i, I would like to say and that is a uh, about a month ago the uh, mm -hmm. the vatican issued a statement um and uh, in the statement what it what it basically did was to um, uh, elevate catholicism yeah, above mm -hmm. other other faiths and other denominations of Christianity, um, it basically was was a declaration of superiority over other faiths. So one thing we we need to ask is, well, what has changed in the last hundred five hundred years if they're still issuing these statements? Yeah, right. um, it's really the same mentality, the same ideology, and uh, until uh, you know. The Catholic Church, you know, acknowledges other faith, other religions as equals. Yeah, yeah, not superior. Mm -hmm. There's, there's never going to be peace. Yeah, we're always there's going to, you know, we're going to be trapped in this, this, you know, superiority, do, dominion, domination. It, it seems to be that way uh, with many, with many religions all across the board. You know, right, sure. And I think that's the the importance of, of people really analyzing 
um, actions and which is why I'm happy that um, knowing about my own heritage and, and knowing coming from a spiritual background or the way that right. people were carried on a spiritual way of life rather than a quote-unquote religious way of life you know sure. and sure. Uh, I think that's something important for all people and I think uh, more people are you seeing a change in that as well that people are starting to understand the idea of spirituality yeah right I as opposed to organized religion sure and I think this is also her, uh, occurring within many in the Catholic Church itself because yeah. I know many were upset with this with this statement of, right. of you know Christian superiority and you know it's kind of like we, we need to get get beyond this right. you know we need to move forward well once again yeah. um, I want to thank you right for for coming here and I mean just starting off with uh, who you are Boricua living in Hawaii yeah. talking about uh, the the families that were were moved from the island of Boriqueño or what we now know right. as Puerto Rico today right. Uh, forcibly or somehow coerced to getting over to the Hawaiian oh, yeah. Islands yeah right I mean I think it puts a real context into everything else we've been speaking about because it all started with the papal bull in other right. words they weren't able to right. move people around right. unless it was the church condoning the action of these right. quote-unquote explorers moving them around and coming over here to think that they were better than the native peoples right. of this hemisphere in particular starting out with the Tainos in the Caribbean well it's important to, to point out that you know the reason for my involvement in this issue is um, ancestral and yeah. um, as a descendant of those peoples I feel it's important to speak out yeah because our ancestors were, were silenced and mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, as long as I can speak and 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 move, uh, I'll continue to uh, educate and you know build awareness uh, among the public ar around this issue. And I, you know, I feel a, a, a strong drive and obligation to uh, uh, continue the work. Well, Tony, uh, on behalf of behalf of Access for All, okay. I want to thank you for coming down and uh, sharing this information. Uh, important information and the viewers will see that um, all the contact information if you want to get in touch with uh, Tony or myself will be available on the screen um, during the closing credits so once again uh, I'm Roberto Borrero I want to thank you for tuning in and um, until next time think native and welcome balance mahalo and the Christians, with their horses and swords and pikes, began to carry out massacres and strange cruelties against them. They attacked the towns and spared neither children nor the aged, nor pregnant women, nor women in childbed, not only stabbing them and dismembering them, but cutting them to pieces as if dealing with sheep in a slaughterhouse.